Welcome to the world of uh, e-learning and online education. And I want to present to you today uh, kind of the opening presentation I use in a course, uh, BSE uh, 3630, which is called Marketing Channels and Supply Chain. Uh, many of you will be taking that course from me and uh, or watching this video if that course is online in Fall Quad A, which I hope we're not. So without further ado, this is part one. Here's a cartoon from The New Yorker that was in uh, late fall last year. And two people walking out of store, it says, it warms my heart to see their look of hope that we might actually not buy it online. Uh, do you know what that's called when people go to the store to look at things and then turn around and buy it online, which people are doing with increasing frequency? It's called showrooming. It's, uh, and this is from like Investopedia. It's a consumer practice of examining products in a store and then purchasing them online at a lower price. It's more and more common as mobile usage increases and a new price check and shopping apps emerge. Uh, there is some myth about that, but one thing that I found to be absolutely true is that online shopping took off with the advent of the smartphone. Amazon was around in the 90s. They were doing a lot of uh, good things, but uh, people had to go onto their computer and actually log into Amazon on, on some website and buy it. Now, with the smartphone and like an Amazon app, it, you could be anywhere at any time and say, oh, I should buy that. And you pull out your phone like you would check a text or check Instagram and go on Amazon and say, you know, look up this product. I like the price. It's okay. Order it. Have it shipped to my home. Forget about it. You're done in a matter of seconds. The other thing is people don't actually price check as much as uh, everybody thinks they do and just assume that Amazon has the cheapest price when it often doesn't. One of the reasons, uh, you know, if we look at retail space in the U.S., and I had a statistic that I was looking at 10 years ago, actually. It was actually 2006 I was looking at it. And we talk about the number of square feet per person. So this is the retail space. Uh, square feet per a thousand people and thank you Professor Volmert for finding me this graphic that updated what I had so this was uh, a more recent view of it but if you look at the United States we have 21,500 uh, square feet per thousand people or 21 square and a half square feet of retail per person Scandinavia the European countries not remarkably are, are, are follow suit with Scandinavia not behind us. But the closest competitor was Norway with like 10 square feet per person of retail. We have 21.5. You think we have too much? Is that why stores are closing like crazy with uh, just a little bit of e-commerce coming our way? So this is an interesting stat. Sweden was next with 4.6. And then Spain, 2.6 per person square feet. Italy, 2.45. Germany, two square feet per, of retail per person. Russia, 1.3. China, not even a half a square foot, less than half a square foot per person. So it's kind of crazy the amount of, of, of space that we have in the United States. Uh, and it's no wonder that things are always on sale because there's so much retail space. They can't possibly, and we have so many goods on the shelves, that they don't sell out and people have to move them. We're used to this discount mentality of things always being on sale, always being on offer. Uh, I read, relate a story that we used to have in Colgate Latin America where I worked. We would have our, sometimes we would have our logistics team meetings at the northern tip of Latin America, which was in the United States, but the city of Miami. And we would always meet at the Dadeland Marriott. Why did we meet at the Dadeland Marriott? Because it was within walking distance of the Dadeland Mall, and almost all of my people, and these are directors and managers of logistics and transportation and warehousing from all the various countries in, in Latin America, would walk to the Dadeland Mall 
and shop. And they would like, take tons of They would bring empty suitcases just to carry clothes home. I remember that, uh, you know, if you went to uh, Mexico and wanted to buy a polo shirt, you had to go, like, to an exclusive store. And the shirts were, like, uh, $90 for, you know, a, a short sleeve polo three-button shirt. And, uh, you know, yeah, you can buy equal quality in the U.S. for always find something on sale. So we have too much retail space. So the topics we want to cover is the customer service value chain and the power of IT in changing this face of retail. What Sears, no one even thinks of Sears anymore, kind of taught Amazon. Uh, Piggly Wiggly, the creation of the grocery store, the emergence of Walmart. Amazing Amazon, it's not even close to an overview. And the online ordering, uh, uh, your professorial comp confessions, that's my confessions. And then some videos that you can look at beyond this video. So if we look at the customer service supply chain, this is a picture I drew for my people. Uh, it must have been in the late 90s. It's uh, been refined a little bit. But the, the, the customer service value chain, the supply chain, if you will, the operations fulfillment chain, is we have order taking and fulfillment in a company. Uh, the trade is what consumer products companies, and my bias is based on fast moving consumer products, which is exactly what most people buy in retail anyway. They buy home goods, uh, you know, uh, uh, personal care items like Colgate and Procter and Gamble would sell. They buy food like Nestle, Lever, and uh, General Foods and Kraft, and uh, everybody else makes. Um, they would buy consumer electronics. They would buy which, uh, and they would buy phones, whatever the case may be. And the trade is the stores that sell things to customers. All those companies I mentioned don't sell directly to customers. They sell their customers are the people that buy from them, and those are called the trade: the WalMarts, the Targets, the Amazons, uh, the Macy's. Uh, right down to the CVS, the Walgreens of the world. They're called the trade. An order is placed from the trade. The order is processed and then released to a warehouse. The warehouse then picks the goods from their various shelves and distributes the goods, loads them into trucks, and sends them to the trade. This is the lifeblood of most consumer packaged goods company, the order taking and fulfillment process. How does stuff get into the warehouse? Well, they have some manufacturing planning. You know, we have to have the right products in the right place at the right time in the right quantities. So we have to make the right products in the right place at the right time to achieve that goal. We communicate that to purchasing because we don't make everything. We buy raw and packaging materials, semi-finished goods, and we communicate that to our outside suppliers. Those outside suppliers produce those goods based on our schedule that we give them and then provide those goods in a timely basis to the manufacturing that then takes those raw packaged and semi-finished goods and mixes them together either in assembly or actually does some more sophisticated processing to them and adds value and creates a, product, a finished good of higher value that's then put into our finished goods warehouses which are then allocated or it, you know, you take that inventory and allocate it to the various warehouses that you have uh, around the country. Maybe if you only have one, it probably is attached to the factory. If you have several, they're probably strategically scattered around the country. These two processes are tethered by something called forecasting, demand planning, whatever you want to call it. But it's a weak tether because forecasting is nothing but trying to predict what happens in the future. If you look at this picture in another way, everything going this way from, uh, if you're looking at the screen from right to left, is information. Placing an order, information. The order is processed, information processing. The order is released to the warehouse, information. A forecast, an information of what we plan to produce in the next several months, maybe up to 18. Walmart has an 18-month future forecast that they keep rolling out. So um, manufacturing planning is a giant spreadsheet that's information. The purchasing um, takes that and makes a purchasing plan, which they release in um, purchase orders or um, 
order process orders to be processed by their suppliers. Now it's not until you get to here that on moving left to right, everything then is physical items. The supplier supplies raw pack and semi-finished goods to manufacturing, who then mixes them up, assembles them, adds value, heat treats them, uh, injection molds them, does whatever it has to do to create the finished goods, which are higher value uh, material. That, that material is then allocated to the warehouse, which is then picked and put into trucks and sent to the trade, put on their grocery shelves eventually, so that consumers can go in and buy these things. What has happened with ERP systems, Enterprise Resource Planning Systems, think SAP and Oracle for the most part, Microsoft uh, has their own version of this, is that all the information is now available to everybody. When I first started in industry, that was not the case. And the information used to take longer, longer, believe it or not, to get from here to here than it does today. Now it's almost instantaneous. That's why I call it an instantaneous information conduit. In the, where materials flow from one place to the other, anybody that needs to have the information could have it immediately. So if I sell a tube of toothpaste, Walmart sells a tube of toothpaste, and I'm Colgate Palmolive. I should have, I could get immediate knowledge that, ooh, the, the Walmart in um, uh, Louisville, uh, Mississippi, sold a tube of toothpaste. And then I could let the supplier that provides the plastic pellets that get molded into toothpaste caps know that, oh, we sold a tube of toothpaste, your, your customer Colgate uh, and their customer Walmart sold a tube of toothpaste in uh, Louisville, Mississippi, uh, we're going to need some more plastic. So send a uh, ship immediately the amount of plastic to make another cap for a tube of toothpaste because that's what we're going to need. Uh, obviously, you don't. It, nothing works at that level of, uh, and, and that would be a very inefficient way to do it. But whoever needs whatever information and however it's summarized and aggregated and processed and made into a forecast or a manufacturing plan. Whoever needs that information should be able to see it kind of at the speed of the, the internet. And we don't know how fast that is. That was me stamping my fingers. Um, uh, the internet is pretty much ridiculously fast compared to sending mail, uh, mailing um, purchase orders or uh, even faxing them or even doing electronic data well, electronic data transfer is basically using the internet these days. So the changing face of retail is e-commerce is surging. Now, here's a fact. Before Christmas time of last year, the amount of e-commerce done in the United States was like 9.9%, basically 10%. Everybody thinks it's much higher, but there's a lot of stores that people still go to to buy stuff. Uh, there's not a lot of e-commerce done on the goods that are sold out of Walgreens and convenience stores and CVSs and even local grocery stores sell a lot more than people are buying online. Uh, brick and mortar is waning. Actually, I think it's not going away. It's right sizing based on, you know, the amount of square feet of retail we have. There's a lot of showrooming going on and uh, there's a lot of multi-channel activity going on. Multi-channel means I can buy at home and have it delivered at home. I can buy it online from home or wherever I am and pick it up at the store. There's a lot of curbside pickup at, at groceries. I can order it and then my local grocery store, Mariano's, Sunset Foods, uh, Jewel, uh, Target will have someone walk through the store, do all the picking for me, uh, select my goods, bag it all up, and then when I just drive up and they put it in my trunk. This is going to surge with this uh, COVID pandemic right now. Or I could buy in the store online and ship to home. Uh, this is a real-time transformation. This is a list from 2016 of the readings that I gave at the first day of the uh, marketing channels and supply chain class. They're out of date. It's only four years later. 
but they're completely out of date. It's three and a half years later, actually. And uh, the articles are all out of date because some of these stores that we talk about have gone out of business. Some of these have changed and began doing things. Uh, Amazon begins selling perishable uh, private label foods. Well, they're increasing that even more. Amazon expands their private label offerings. They're taking that to a new level. Um, let's see, where else are we at? The future of advertising, farewell mass marketing. It's all done individual. Uh, Best Buy is mounting troubles. Well, Best Buy seems to have weathered that storm. Macy's fixed for department stores. I think they have stabilized a little bit. Uh, so you look at this. Where's one that uh, Bed Bath & Beyond, a good example uh, of a bad situation. I think things have actually gotten worse for them. Um, and people retail slump shows the Amazon effect. The Amazon effect is taking even a larger toll moving forward. But then other, uh, other people have not stood still and let Amazon eat their lunch. So there's a tremendous transformation going on. And every time I teach this course, there's a whole new set of readings and a whole new set of priorities that are happening. Uh, so this is unfolding right in front of our face. Um, and it really involves, uh, this is one of my favorite graphics from a Harvard Business Review article called uh, Competing for the Future. And uh, by Hamill and Prahalad. And it's from 1994, but it still applies. I mean, you have to look at today. Which customers do you serve today? Who are your customers in the future? Through which channels do you reach your customers today? Through which channels will you reach your customers in the future? Who are your competitors today? Who will be your competitors in the future? Uh, what is the basis for competitive advantage today? What will be your basis for competitive advantage in the future? What skills or capabilities make you unique today? What skills or capabilities make you unique in the future? Companies got to be asking themselves this all the time. Um, you know, people were caught flat-footed when Amazon emerged and the cell phone helped accelerate the growth of that company. Um, I mean, if you're, if you're Apple and you're thinking about who's your competitors today, well, in the United States, it's basically only Samsung and a, few, a handful of other minor players. Uh, the, the Chinese companies of Oppo and Huawei have not reached this shore yet selling cell phones. They will come. Same thing for automotive. Who are their competitors today? If you're Ford and GM, you're thinking, well, you know, uh, Ford, GM, and Chrysler are the big three in Detroit. Um, you're thinking about, okay, Toyota, Nissan, you know, the Japanese companies, the German companies, the Korean companies. Again, probably half the cars sold in China are Chinese label. And there seem to be good cars from what I recall last time I was there, but they're not sold here yet. They're going to come eventually, and they're going to take market share from a GM that in the 19, late 1950s had 80% of the U.S. market. Right now they have about 19%. So if uh, the Chinese companies come and take three, four percentage share, uh, share points from them, they could be down to the low teens by the time this is over. All right. So why the growing importance of marketing channels? Well, the explosion of information technology and e-commerce has made that all possible. Uh, companies have a greater difficulty in gaining and sustaining a competitive advantage, even though I think Amazon is the example of a company that has done that. But other people are trying to rapidly catch up as, as fast as they can. And guess what? Amazon's not standing still and letting them do that. The growing power of distributors, especially retails and mar especially retailers and marketing channels. There is a need to reduce distribution costs reduce warehousing costs, and therefore uh, provide savings to consumers. So if we look at direct from producer to consumer, uh, custom on demand, direct to customer, no storage or warehouse, no transportation costs, good for low volumes. Okay, that's great. So if I want to buy uh, an instrument, like let's say I want to buy a fancy guitar from a fancy guitar manufacturer, I'm going to spend $4,000, $5,000, $10,000 for a guitar. Uh, in fact, the instrument I play is called an oud. The premier maker of those instruments right now is in Turkey, and he's charging $6,000 an instrument. I can buy from his shop. His only, his only, it's a warehouse that he has right, basically a storefront. 
and where he makes instruments or I can custom buy it and they'll ship it directly to me. Uh, there's no storage, really essentially no storage or warehouse cost. Uh, the transportation cost is, I don't know why I put no transportation cost. Obviously there is some transportation cost, but it's oftentimes, is, you know, if I'm spending 6,000, it costs me $200 to ship it from Turkey to here. It's the whole price of $6,200, take it or leave it if I want that or not. And it's good for low volume, custom made kind of products. Traditional retailers are, are on a different scale. Um, and you see the graphic here that says one mile to go. Producers can get the product close to you. And they can do that in, um, I don't know why that's in the way. Let's move it out of the way. Get it close to you. They do large scale uh, production and they have containerized or palletized shipping uh, and get it within a couple miles of your house. And that's why they call a lot of retail uh, the, a problem in retail the last mile. So they get it to a warehouse close to where you live or work, and they get the goods within, that's what we call it, a mile, that's uh, the last mile. They get it within a couple miles of your house. You go that last mile to the store, you pick what you want, you purchase it, and you transfer, transport it at home and use the product or store it. That's why grocery stores exist. From farm to fork, they can get the food to you very efficiently and the goods, those kinds of goods to you very efficiently by full truckload, palletized delivery. Everything is made as efficient as possible. Uh, it goes from the farm to the producer. The producer processes the food. The food is then packaged and put in their finished good warehouse and pallets. The pallets are then uh, delivered out of their finished good warehouse to the retailer finished good warehouse and then picked from there and sent to various stores in various quantities. And then your local Marianas puts it on the shelf and they've got there as cheaply as they possibly can. And now it's up to you to go to the store, which is basically just a warehouse, but it's really a nice looking warehouse because they were trying to make it comfortable for customers and consumers. And you pick, make the final assortment of what goes into your basket and pay for it and take it home. This is what it looks like. You got the maker or manufacturer. They have their DCs. They have a store DC, and I'm saying sub K because they may have several ones. This says the DC here has, you know, the manufacturer may have distribution center one, two, up to N. N is usually, depending on what it is that they're making, could be five, it could be 10, it could be three, it could be only one. And here, the retail store, the company Walmart, how many DCs do they have around the country? The DCs replenish the store and then the customer and consumer goes to them. So if you have three storage locations, finish, um, you know, you have your fixed cost allocations or rent for storage and you have your administrative costs. Three movements, so here's movement one, movement two, movement three to get it to the retail store, where each one has a, pack, a pick and load cost, transportation cost, and unload and put away costs. I mean, that's when you transfer from one physical building to another, whether it's a factory or warehouse, you can call it whatever you want. And people are texting me all along here. I don't know why. Uh, I should turn that off but I'm in the middle of a presentation. So you have these fixed cost allocations or rent for storage here and here and here. And then you have the transfer costs here, here, and here. And then the whole point of a retail store is that the customer comes and does the picking here and transports at home. So normally when you think of, hey, I can order something online, and the retail store can just pick it for me and deliver it to my house. Just because you can order it online doesn't make it cheaper. They've got to hire someone or allocate someone to go and pick your goods for you in the store and then put it in a vehicle and ship it to your house. It's got to be an added cost. It doesn't just make it cheaper. So three warehouse. A store is just a warehouse, as we said before. It's just a better looking one because it has to make comfortable customers and consumers, which are just everyday people, not warehouse workers, uh, 
feel comfortable in there. It has to be attractive. It has to be a nice setting. All the fruit, rather than being in uh, then boxes and pallets stored in shelves, it has to be nicely displayed and look beautiful and make you want to be there. So what are the DC functions? Receive and put away goods. Shelving and displays are storage locations. Um, orders are then picked, packaged, prepared, or consolidated, and loading them into a, a truck. Well, in this case, an S, a car, an SUV, or a minivan. So what's the difference? You've got product line on shelves. Here we don't know what the product is. We have to look at the labels to see. Well, here we don't know what the product is either. We have to look at the labels to see. But the labels are colorful and attractive to consumers. Uh, you have things displayed. You have things displayed. They're on floor storage. They're in shelves. Uh, we've seen things where maybe they even bring the pallet in and have it displayed on the floor or in different ways. Uh, it's it's just a store is a warehouse. It's one way of looking at it. So what Amazon has done, and it was this was their innovation in books when they first came online, was to eliminate the retail store. To do that, then they ship directly from their DC to the customer. Now they reduce the storage location, the bookstore. Their fixed cost allocations and rent for that storage and the administrative costs for that. They eliminated one pick load cost, one transportation cost, one unload and put away cost. Now their warehouse is not geared for shipping directly to consumers. So they had to reinvent what their DCs look like, their distribution centers. And that was the innovation that Amazon brought. Next thing that Amazon would like to do, if they could possibly, is if they and they got big enough where they could do it, is they order directly from the manufacturer to their DC and eliminate those DCs. So they reduced another the fixed cost allocations and rent and storage that would be there and negotiated a lower price and all these administrative costs, and then they eliminated another pick load transportation unload and put away costs. So those just go away, and what happens? All of a sudden, they're able to offer the product cheaper to you than like a Macy's could do, like a Barnes & Noble bookstore could do, than a Kroger's, which or a Mariano's, which is part of Kroger's, could do. So they're a major disruptor. This, well, Eliminating is called disintermediation, which is a cool word that you should all memorize because, you know, if you can use it and people don't know what it means, you can say, well, you know, if you went to college now and looked at what we're doing, you would understand this word, and it's called disintermediation. It basically means eliminating the middleman. So I can hear my mother in the background saying, well, why don't you just use that? Why do you have to make up this fancy word that no one understands? I don't know why. And here's what we're trying to do. You have transportation costs and you have warehousing costs. And, and you have your total logistics costs. We're trying to reduce this. Uh, actually, it should be right there, but that's okay. The way they draw this picture is fine. Uh, we want to reduce these costs. So we want to move this curve down here. And we want to move this curve down this way as much as we possibly can. And this is the, if we look at the total logistics cost to get to a consumer. Obviously, the more warehouses you have, the more your warehousing costs go up, but the lower your transportation costs, theoretically. So we're trying to disintermediate both the transportation costs and the warehousing costs by eliminating the number of warehouses in the system and using them more strategically. And that's the magic of Amazon. If you look at food retailing in the US, um, I'll let you look at this slide, but you're talking about food and retail market was $5.3 trillion in 2015. It's, uh, it's probably grown since then. Um, online grocery sales were only $20 billion in 2016 and spending, uh, 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 anticipated to be $100 billion in 2025. Out of $5.3 that's a very small number. 
The top three performers in 2015 were Walmart, Kroger, and Costco. Um, they probably are still the, the largest retailers, and it's not e-commerce retailer. If you look at largest e-commerce e retailers, it's probably Amazon, Walmart, and then someone else. Uh, top online grocery stores, and well, here it is right here. Amazon Grocery, I think Walmart is number two, and then I've never heard of Fresh Direct I've heard of, but these other ones, I don't even know if they still exist. Uh, fresh foods, 21% of shoppers report that they purchased more than uh, more fresh perishable goods than they did in the previous year. There's been a movement to fresh. The problem with fresh is, um, you know, the nice thing about frozen and packaged goods um, is you keep disease down. Fresh, you open it up to foodborne uh, contaminants uh, and contagions. Uh, freshly prepared foods, a lot of grocery stores will do that. Uh, they have a picture of sushi here and online shopping. Uh, consumers are considering more freshly prepared foods, 5% meals or salads, 13% meals or seafood. And I think they're trying to compete with restaurants and who knows who's going to win. Is the Grubhub going to win in this COVID crisis or the grocery stores that can provide you meals at home? Uh, what's important uh, to consumers? 81% want high quality produce, 79% low prices, 78% want high quality meats, 75% want a great product and selection and variety. And obviously you can't add those up. It adds up to way more than 100%. So people want a lot of those things at the same time. Uh, negative impact on sales and profits. Uh, as you're, the, the constant pressure for reducing price increases, uh, there's competition, there's Fees, there's cost of health care benefits, there's upward wage pressure, state and government regulations, and a positive impact on sales and profits is, you know, the health and wellness concept. People want to eat better foods uh, for the most part, and um, food as a medicine, which is, it seems to be a trend. change in the patterns of, uh, in the in the patterns of food consumption uh, I and mean, one of those is like you just look at carbonated beverages um, you know every beverage you know if you look at Pepsi Nestle and coca-cola uh, coca-cola and Pepsi have reduced the amount of carbonated beverages and gone to more waters and teas and sport drinks and all of those zero calorie kinds of drinks with natural ingredients as opposed to zero calorie degrees with um, chemicals. And one of the things, you can see that just in, if you have to take a class in Magnuson. When I first started teaching at North Park in 2015, I would say 60% of the beverage offerings in the Carlson, uh, I mean not Carlson, the Magnuson lobby uh, vending machines were carbonated beverages. Uh, Coke, Diet Coke, Pepsi, Diet Pepsi. Now, if you go there, uh, that's probably only 10% of the offerings in those vending machines. And there's the waters and tea. So those patterns are changing, and, the, and the, both the uh, consumer products companies and the grocery stores have to keep up with it. So when we talk about last mileage, uh, mile logistics, uh, this is what we're talking about. 81% of recently surveyed retailers reported their supply chain was not prepared to implement other channel retail strategy. Well, this was probably a few years ago. I think a lot of companies have done it and gone to curbside pickup. I think this COVID thing is going to accelerate that even more. E-commerce online orders are expected to reach $1.35 by 2018. An increase of 28%. 28% is huge, but out of a $5.3 trillion spend, it's not. So this is kind of the space that we're talking about here. So let's go backwards a little bit and talk about what Sears taught Amazon. And I think I'll do that in part two of this. And probably in part two, we'll cover what Sears taught Amazon and Piggly Wiggly and then we'll spend some time 
<clears throat> in part three on Amazon itself, and then online ordering and variety of different uh, videos that uh, you can look at. And I'll provide the videos and probably a, uh, a Word document so you can just click on those and go see them. Thank you very much and looking forward to talking to you in part two.